Biobalance HealthCast episode 209, Diagnosing and Treating Traumatic Brain Injury. Biobalance HealthCast features conversations about positive aging. Your hosts are Dr. Kathy Maupin, Medical Director of Biobalance Health and a leading expert in treating symptoms of aging, and Brett Newcomb, a licensed professional counselor. Welcome to the BioBalance HealthCast. I'm Brett Newcomb, and this is Dr. Kathy Maupin, the fo- founder of BioBalance Health. And we do a series of podcasts. Many of you watch them pretty regularly. This week and last week, we are having conversations around something that's been in the news because the, the news has brought it to the focus of our attention, but it has been a long-time concern, and we're learning more and more about how to recognize and respond to traumatic brain injuries. Mm-hmm. And part of the, the reason that that's coming into the forefront uh, of our attention is all the news with the NFL and the NFL season and people that get concussions and brain injuries. People are bringing lawsuits against the NFL. And well, they are. But they're not, being settled. And not just the NFL. I mean, you, you, they're they're bringing them against uh, equipment manufacturers. They're bringing them against high schools. They're bringing them against colleges. Mm-hmm. The issue of sports-related brain trauma is coming more into focus for us. But then a, a horrible corollary topic of focus is that we have been a nation at war for 13 years. We have Mm -hmm. soldiers, men and women in combat situations who are experiencing horrific brain injuries and brain traumas that have to be treated and taken care of. And so that's all in our consciousness now. But the research is saying that other things should be in our consciousness as well, that you can have a significant uh, brain injury as a result of a fall, that most uh, dramatic traumatic brain injuries are the result of simple falls. So children or elderly adults... Not a fall where you fall on your behind. A fall where you hit your where head. Where you hit your head. You slip on a wet floor. You slip in a bathtub. Fall down you the stairs. You trip down a flight of stairs. Uh, you trip over the dog when you get up and And these may the be things that you may not even consider that significant because you didn't exactly. go to the hospital. Yes. And it's even, it used to be like my daughter rode horses and mm-hmm. jumped. Mm-hmm. Okay. So she was get thrown. That spinal jolt when you land. Yeah. If you don't land properly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. So, but she was, but it wasn't even that she was thrown. Those kids are yeah. always, they wear helmets, mm-hmm. but she, she was thrown and she had, she didn't get, she didn't pass out. Right. However, after that, I mean, she kind of was a little out of it for a week or two. So she did have an effect. She right. didn't go to the emergency room because she didn't lose consciousness. Mm-hmm. But now we know you don't have to lose consciousness to have some kind of uh, damage to your well, brain. And so what we want to say is it's not just the dramatic visible injuries, you know, like somebody breaks their neck and they can't move or mm-hmm. walk. Uh, quite often, it's something that comes back years later or mm-hmm. manifests years later as, as a mood disorder or a memory and thought process, a cognitive disorder from mm-hmm. brain damage when you were young uh, or younger. Or repetitive damage. Repetitive you may have damage. repetitive, mild brain injuries. You keep slapping your head. <laughs> <laughs> or, I mean, if you, any anything that would cause you, like, the kids riding, mm-hmm. they get thrown a bunch, mm-hmm. then they're additive. So that causes additive damage to the brain and more likelihood that you're going to have symptoms from this. Right. And and it's very likely, up until recently, that you may be misdiagnosed because they're going to look at you as a simple depression. Mm-hmm. They're going to, a doctor will look at you as, well, this is anxiety. This is... Um, a hormone disorder, but they're not going to go in and look at all the hormones from the pituitary to see if maybe the pituitary has been damaged by trauma. Right. So oftentimes what we're trying to do is give you enough information that you can talk to your doctor and say, well, I know that all these symptoms could have been secondary to repetitive auto accidents. I have people in my office who have had four or five auto accidents where they hit their head. And I I find that unbelievable, but true yeah. i guess they were just really unlucky and they weren't always driving well exactly. so that's one of those things that does over t- over time and over repetition cause damage and and they the people that i've seen have had significant problems with their hormones and their and their moods and also uh their coordination their balance so many times replacing the hormones that's one of the things that that um the doctor that has been has been working on this for a long time, Mark Gordon, talks about. He says you have to replace the hormones 
that are not being made by the by the pituitary that's in the center because of your of the brain. Damage. From and that helps, injury. and that helps your symptoms. Mm -hmm. So the treatment is to replace, bring you back to normal, and then you are less likely to have the symptoms that go along with the brain injury, and your brain's more likely to repair itself. The brain will try to repair itself if uh, automatically on its own it will mm -hmm. try to repair itself. But there are things that need to be done, and and part of what we are trying to call to your attention is that quite regularly you are given diagnostic labels. You are told, well, this is an issue of panic attacks, or this is an issue of depression, or this is a personality change, especially psychi as a psychiatric of that diagnoses. Yeah. And they have medicines for those things, and they give you those things. But what we're saying is that you should also consider the possibility of a mild traumatic brain injury and look at that in terms of planning treatment strategies for it and so on. Uh, for instance, when they classify uh, psychiatric disorders, they classify them into what are called Axis 1 or Axis 2 mm -hmm. disorders, with uh, the Axis 2 disorders being more severe. The Axis 1 disorder is the one people have more commonly, mm -hmm. and so they, they have this statement in the research, traumatic brain injury seems to make patients particularly susceptible to depre depressive episodes, delusional disorders, and personality disturbances. So then they go through statistics of people who have been diagnosed with those labels of uh, Axis 1. 48% of the people with an Axis 1 diagnosis have had some kind of mild brain trauma. Of those, major depression, 26%. Mm -hmm. Of the people that are diagnosed with major depressions mm -hmm. also have mild brain trauma. And so there are symptoms and side effects that identify that and call it to your attention. And then there are treatments that can be obtained for that mm -hmm. above and beyond the classic or traditional treatments for depression. And the, and the classical and tr traditional treatments don't work as well in patients if it's a who have a traumatic brain injury. Exactly. So, that means you have you have to add the their answer is add the hormones mm -hmm. to the antidepressants. Yes, and that makes them work like they're supposed to work. Mm -hmm. so, so you develop compensatory strategies that help fight the depression, and you can fight it better when you can understand that part of what's causing the depression is the brain injury, and not just the relational problem or the emotional issue that might make you depressed. Right. So, and that's one of them. But even alcohol abuse is yes. related to head injury. So, and I would assume that would mean drug abuse because you're trying to. Right. People are often trying to self-medicate, right. and they do that with food as well. Mm -hmm. And so, patients who have had this and they don't they don't feel completely like themselves oftentimes have to right. or try to escape using something like alcohol or drugs, which of course makes it worse. Mm -hmm. So, Well, if you go back and look at our last podcast, we were talking about the different symptoms that are located for injuries in different lobes of the mm -hmm. brain, the pride on the front, all the occipital, and so on. And so you run into things, depending on where your head was injured, mm -hmm. that may manifest as a psychiatric disorder, like mm -hmm. OCD. Mm -hmm. You may have problems with uh, perseverance and constant repetition of thoughts or words mm -hmm. or songs or phrases or behaviors or whatever they might be to the point that those repetitions are intrusive uh, and disruptive of your lifestyle and that may be because of some psychological issue but it may just as likely be because of a brain trauma to that particular part of your brain I think it makes it easier to accept when you really realize that you had an accident and it did, it wasn't something this that it, you did yes. that or that you're you were defective in. It's well, and something the, that happened to you. That's what people decide. Is there's something wrong with me? I am defective in some way. Right. I've done something bad. I've earned it. And so it's And my, that's just, just not true. That's not it. It's, it's a result of a lot of things. And one of those things might be a brain trauma. Mm -hmm. so, and that's what we're trying to bring to, to the fore so that you can consider it as an option so for what, causation. What Kathy tells me, about which I know nothing, <laughs> uh, but about which she knows a great deal, is that the issue gets compounded and complicated by the hormones in your body and in your brain. If you have traumatic brain injury that causes, for instance, the cells of a particular hardwired spot in your head to die, mm -hmm. uh, to attempt to regenerate but not necessarily reconnect all the nerve endings that are there, the things like uh, human growth hormone, testosterone, progesterone, can play an impact on those things. It has a huge impact on, on healing and on inflammation. One of the reasons 
that you can have an injury when you're 16 and it affects you when you're 50 is that there's an ongoing inflammatory process that is ongoing after the initial trauma. So our hormones, testosterone, progesterone, cortisol, are all Uh anti-inflammatory. And so that decreases this ongoing damage. Well, if you don't have those hormones, and it may be from because of the brain injury or maybe because you're aging, Mm -hmm. if you don't have those hormones, then that inflammation continues and continues to to cause trouble and cause damage to your brain. So it's ongoing. If you have hormones, it stops it. So it's very important to have growth hormone, testosterone, cortisol if you're if your cortisol is low to and thyroid to replace and repair your brain and stop the ongoing damage that way i mean it's like a stop sign it's it's done you're not going to continue this political controversy it is it's it's huge not so much a medical controversy but a political controversy something potentially and it has entered the fda which is both which gets all mixed up in it, but the question then becomes, should we restrict and limit the ability to receive human growth Growth hormone hormone. uh, when we can show physiologically that injuries and illnesses have caused a a loss in production and development Mm -hmm. of normal human growth hormone, which then impacts your ability to grow and develop and mature appropriately and be healthy. Mm -hmm. If we can show that that has been diminished, and then why can't we replace that? There are restrictions. There are political agendas. There the are only, economic agendas. The only indication that is legal for growth hormone mm-hmm. is is growth abnormalities in children. So we don't have an adult human growth hormone indication that's accepted by the FDA. However, because it's been misused in sports, yes, then the DEA gets involved. And the DEA finds doctors who are writing growth hormone for good reason for people like this. That, that have that repetitive have, head injuries. And or, have a low growth hormone. Yeah. And then they suspend their licenses. I mean, it's really difficult to be a doctor who does prescribe growth hormone. So they've put up these roadblocks so that you can't be treated. So in our free country, we're not really free. Well, is the argument either way an argument that's based on correlation these things are related to one another so we're assuming a conclusion or are they causative one causes a specific change are we talking about head injuries or are we talking about bureaucracy human growth hormone (laughs) (laughs) human growth hormone and the replacement of the hormone can we say this deficit that causes the deficit human growth hormone is caused by head head injury? injury yes and yes. So then, why can't we, can we say, say if that this person has a head injury, or if because they that's have not an criteria. indication approved by the FDA? Okay. And you know, the I have I have a hard time understanding laws that limit good people from providing good treatment to people who need it. Mm-hmm. When we're making those laws just because of a small number of people who abuse it. Mm-hmm. So, to me. They're they're mistaking treatment for abuse of a drug, and we either have to have the FDA approve it for these reasons so that we can help people, because sometimes testosterone's not enough. Mm-hmm. I mean, testosterone does stimulate growth hormone, but it won't do that in this case. This is not going to be enough for a head injury patient. They're going to need growth hormone, well, too. Well, it's the same way that you give testosterone to replace libido, but not virility, or not fertility. You right. can't give enough for that. Well, you can't give it for fertility because it would it would um, change the uh, external sexual properties of of a baby mm-hmm. if you give a lot of testosterone when someone's trying to conceive. So we don't do it for that reason. Right. It's not that. It's I mean that's why you have doctors write this. Yeah. So the doctor knows that you have you give one person this and you give another person something to determine else. Determine dosage and usage. It's not it's not a um, online thing that you can just go on and say oh I want this or I want that. The implications are the things that you don't know, and you don't even well, think about 
That's what we're here for. And, and frankly, I would much prefer to have my physician who studied all of this <laughs> make those prescriptive decisions well, that's why than we're my here. politician. Well, that's true. And that's the problem. The problem is that there are a lot of medications, even cancer drugs, that we don't have access to that are being used in Europe. Yeah. But because of the FDA saying they're trying to protect us from ourselves, then we don't have it. So that's So that's a huge political issue here. What we're saying is some people need this, and they need it badly, and it changes their life not to have growth hormone or testosterone or... It makes the quality of their life impossible. Right, and that's the one thing. Growth hormone has been really restricted in its in its ability to be used. So one of the exciting things, though, that has come out of this increased focus and in the new research mm -hmm. is that they have identified some biomarkers that they mm -hmm. can test your body and find that are more than anecdotally suggestive of traumatic brain injury. When we talk about somebody that's fallen, like an adult, that uh, an older person has fallen mm -hmm. alone, or a child that's fallen out of a crib or uh, off of a, a pony, uh, and we say, well, they didn't pass out or they didn't stagger and leer and, and not see for three days. You know, mm -hmm. We don't have that level of damage, but there's But to damage. know if there's damage, there's in um, the uh, journal Brain Pathology, believe it mm -hmm. or not, there's an entire journal for brain pathology. Uh, in 2004, they, they did a study and found this, the two biomarkers were caspase C-A-S-P-A-S-E, and Calpain, C-A-L-P-A-I-N. The biomarkers are things that you can draw blood for and find these specific things in a patient who has brain trauma, but not in someone who doesn't have brain trauma. It's like we have, we have the same kind of things for heart damage, which will tell you if you've had a heart attack or if you just have had chest pain. Mm -hmm. So what it is is a cell, a cell in the brain contains these things, it looks like an enzyme to me, but it looks and like then, it's part of the breakdown enzyme and, is the and cell the dies. Cell dies and, releases and releases these and we the can find it in the blood. The, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. Mm -hmm. That's where they locate it. And so if they can find those markers in your blood from those areas, then they can know that you have brain they cells can say, that are dying yeah. as a result of an injury. Right. And at, at that point, usually I sometimes they use steroids, sometimes they they just try to limit the swelling of the brain. Mm -hmm. But that's because the brain, the brain's kind of unique because it's enclosed in the skull. And so when it swells and pushes up ag no against the, the skull, then oftentimes the, the brain dies where it's being compressed. Right. So they're trying to decrease swelling. They're trying to increase oxygen. They're trying to decrease inflammation. Well, and, and they do, and we do that in the ICUs. I mean, that's what and, happens and initially. the brain is so fascinating because it has both hardwired and softwired locator, uh, locator sites. Mm -hmm. So for the softwired sites, if you have a stroke or if you have a brain damage that causes injury and death, cell death to that particular spot, very regularly, frequently, the brain will rewire itself around that damaged spot, and you'll never know much of the difference, if any, of the difference. Heart can do that, too. It can develop blood vessels that go and that's around amazing to go me. around the area that's been compromised. I mean, but, that's... But if it's a hardwired spot and you receive and that's the damage the only at the spot side of that is. hardwired spot, then you lose that capacity. That's you true. Know, or if the area is so large, it encompasses yes. all of the uh, possible. I, I like to look at it as a map. Uh -huh. You know, you have a map and, and you look at it on your phone and it says you can go this way. It's 19 minutes and this way. It's 20 minutes and this way. It's 25 right. minutes. So, so you've got these other pathways. But if the area is so big, pathways are all are, are all obstructed they're all gone they right. die so so it's either the the area that's affected or the size of the deficit that that is something that we have to look at and i'm not that type of physician i'm just a horm the hormone doctor you want to but, recognize the symptoms that are flaming so you can make an appropriate referral right you and i I'm and i have to things that make me worry about brain injury Right. I want to send you to this specialist. And when patients explain to me what happened when they were in the ER, mm -hmm. then I have to understand what was really going on. Exactly. So uh, in, in, in investigating this and in doing my research, mm -hmm. part of what I have to do to understand what my patients are going through is understand this and how that affects their hormones and what I should do to help them. Well, at the end of the day, 
what we now know is that there are significantly more numbers of traumatic brain injuries than we ever thought existed before. And some of those are a result of social choices we make, like letting our children play football. Some of them are the result of political choices that we make, like sending our children off to war. But we have a crisis going on within the veterans who are suffering from depression and mood disorders and emotional instability and suicidality that are directly attributable to some of the injuries to their brains from combat. Mm -hmm. We have the same thing going on with the NFL players mm -hmm. and high school and college players, and, and, and that's just football. And then you have hockey and you have uh, baseball. I, I had an adolescent client that got hit in the head with a baseball in the middle of a game. Caused all kinds of damage to his mm. brain and his, his mobility and his functionality. Uh, and, and he's very young and much of that is coming back, but not all of it will. So it is a serious concern. Pay attention to yourself, your parents, and your children, and learn the symptoms so that you can discuss with your physician, is it a possibility that part of what we're dealing with, with the illness or the attitude or the behavior or the school problem or whatever it might be that we're, that we're confronting, that it could be a result of traumatic brain injury. Hope you learned something. I hope this can help you in the future so that you don't have to wonder what's wrong with you and why your treatment's not working. And you can take part in your medical care by suggesting, ah, oh, maybe, because your doctor doesn't know, maybe that auto accident may have had something to do with this. So please use this information to keep you and, and the people you love well. Find a way forward. Thank you for watching. Email your questions or comments to podcast at biobalancehealth.com. You can find the Biobalance HealthCast on iTunes and on YouTube. For more information about bioidentical hormone pellet therapy and other reverse aging solutions, visit biobalancehealth.com or call 314-993-0963. You can find Dr. Maupin on Twitter at Dr. Kathy Maupin and on Facebook at facebook.com slash biobalancehealth. Find Brett Newcomb at brettnewcomb.com.